Oké, een very warm welcome to everybody. Jona Pot Givanok, um, hartelijk welkom in de Bali. Um, my name is Yuri Albrecht, I'm the director of the Bali, and I will be conducting this conversation on Hungary and the European Union tonight. It's been organized on very short notice with a lot of um, help also from the Hungarian um, embassy. Um, very happy to have you here. Um, it's a very timely conversation, of course, because there's a lot of talk about uh, Hungary in the EU and the Article 7 procedure. Some parts of the European Union want to proceed against Hungary and hearings. So it's a very topical uh, uh, moment. I think um, I'm very, very happy to introduce the three speakers here. We're very happy to have Judith Varga uh, here. Um, you're a Minister of Justice of the Republic of Hungary. You've been um, responsible also for EU relations in your former posting as a member of cabinet. You've been working for nine years in the European Parliament. It's good to have you. Um, we have a, a professor uh, from the Maastricht University, uh, Ferenc Lazzo. I think I, I hope I pronounce it in the right way. A professor of um, also history of uh, uh, Europe. And we have a member of European Parliament, Sophie Inetveld, who's a member for Day 66, the Dutch party. A warm welcome to all three of you. Um, it's wonderful to have the conversation. Yes, please come in. There are some, some chairs in the front here. Do come in, then we can start. Uh, because we're a little bit in a hurry, because one and a half hour, and we also want to involve the, 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 the public here the, you're attending. Uh, please mind your, um, your cell phones. Uh, switch them uh, maybe off or maybe on silent mode. You can Twitter along, of course, but um, uh, don't uh, disturb it. And uh, we will have questions at the end. Uh, please wait for, for me the microphone to come because we have a live stream as well. There are a lot of people uh, uh, watching um, uh, from their couches um, all over Europe, actually. So um, please wait for the microphone, otherwise people uh, at home can't hear you. Um, we are very happy to, to have this conversation because the Bali considers this of utmost importance to uh, critically monitor this debate, the differences that exist in Europe uh, about the rule of law, about democracy, about current issues surrounding refugees. So we're very happy that you're willing to um, participate in this conversation. Uh, maybe, maybe I can start out with you, um, uh, Judith Varga, if I may, um, and have a few questions for all three of you, and then we have a more general conversation. Um, um, you started out this morning at five o'clock from Budapest, is that right? Yeah, and you're still uh, alive. <laughs> alive and energetic. <laughs> yes. uh, can you hear me? Like I this? think so, I hope so. Should Thank be. you. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, and you, um, uh, what do you think of Amsterdam? Oh, I love the city. Uh, yeah. When I lived in Brussels, we usually came here uh, with my children, friends. Yeah. Or dropping in for a concert. In my good old days in Brussels, when I was free and not so overloaded as yeah. today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But so you enjoy the atmosphere. Yes, I, I love it very much. And uh, so I have uh, colleagues who actually spent here a couple of uh, months or years as students. So we we are connected to the city. Yeah. But now, as minister, you're no longer able to, to ah. enjoy the evening. Yes, life yes, no. definitely. Um, how do you see the current relationship between Hungary and and the uh, European Union? What What's your take on it? Is it in a very good shape or is it in a not so very good shape? What, what do you make of it? Actually, it's a tricky question because I, I used to work on a, a very professional sector in the environment, energy policy. Mm -hmm. And on my daily routine, actually, I, I had a very good uh, cooperation with my uh, international colleagues from all across Europe. So I, I never uh, realized that uh, there should be any issue. So I, I couldn't actually interpret your question in any way. Uh, mm -hmm. We were normal members, uh, taking part industriously and complying with all the directives. Actually, Hungarians are one of the most uh, eager beavers uh, member states when it comes to the quick implementation of uh, a lot of regulations and uh, or uh, directives. Uh, when it comes, of course, to the to the news, what you can read about my country, uh, this is actually uh, one reason why I came home from Brussels. Because uh, when every morning I open the Le Soir or uh, Le Monde and uh, reading some uh, uh, not uh, really the truth about my country, then I al always send the link to my Belgian friends and said, please read this with these comments. This is not correct here, this is not correct there. Mm -hmm. And I, I saw to build up some kind of preconception about, uh, about the European Union member state. Uh, if, if you are from that member state, you feel you know, like you need to do something. You need to explain. You need to uh, mm -hmm. tell more about uh, what's really going on, not only having the information and the opinion from one angle. 
And uh, of course, uh, after nine years, you are also getting to a crossroads, whether you stay for longer abroad or whether you come home and you raise your children uh, in, your, in your home country. And I think this was a right moment when I was asked to come home to be a state secretary. But you're, you're saying um, uh, while I was working in the parliament, I thought you know, there was a great cooperation. But recently, um, I'm reading the press and I'm... Uh, so at this moment, you would say there is less good relationship than during your period in Brussels? As, as a minister now, you would consider it uh, more difficult to raise I, I, between Brussels I, and, and Budapest? I was trying to say that there are different uh, aspects to this, to this question. Sure. Because as a Hungarian citizen living in Brussels or, or working for the institutions, working on your files, uh, you, are, uh, you, feel, you feel good. But if, uh, as a justice minister, you uh, have to go to panel discussions where the topic is uh, rule of yeah. law, uh, <laughs> then uh, the situation is, is different. Mm. And uh, in, in these uh, situations, my, my task is to, uh, you know, um, in, improve the image because it, it's a bad image and bad mantra, and I'm fighting this bad mantra because it's so easy to have an opinion about a country without uh, actually having lived there, without actually having felt what it is like uh, to live there, to work there, to pay taxes there, to, to have your families and networks in this country. And I also know that, uh, and I welcome here the opposition uh, uh, members in the, in the audience, of course uh, democracy is, is of course in Hungary based on opposition and government party and no one, is, uh, no one can be satisfied always with every measure. Uh, but I think uh, just based on this uh, natural uh, uh, conflicts, what uh, every country has, uh, to build up uh, uh, a situation or a mantra against a country which is actually not in line with the reality, uh, I, I don't think th this, is a, this is a fair uh, treatment, so and I, I don't think it, it leads to a, a good Europe where we can uh, you know, mutually respect each other and work towards a stronger Europe where we can face global challenges. Here would, we just divide the gaps. Would you say that Hungary um, uh, uh, um, complies with the EU policies and regulations for the, the whole, the acquis communautaire, the whole of it? Of course, yeah. of course. Yeah. It is out of question. And if there is any uh, legal about. compatibility mm -hmm. issue, then there are proper tools at hand. This is called the infringement <laughs> procedure, but every infringement procedure is actually preceded by a dialogue uh, between lawyers of the commission services, between lawyers of the of the national institutions, and uh, when they cannot agree uh, in the commission stage, they go to court, and then they comply with the court decision. And when it comes to statistics, because you ask Hungary is a good uh, student or a bad student, actually, if it comes to the number of infringement cases, we are the ninth best. Uh, and when it comes to the quickness of implementing European legislation, we are the third best. Mm -hmm. uh, these are just you know numbers, and. Uh, there are tools for this kind of uh, dialogue when there is the legal compatibility issue because it is also a treaty right to defend your position uh, and then there are tools to solve this kind of so, conflict. So, so in general you would say um, the parties and the institutions in Brussels which are pre or, or governments like the Finnish government who is the chair of, has been the chair of the European Union for the past half year mm -hmm. um, are mistaken. Their, their, their concerns about rule of law and, um, and um, concerns about uh, human rights issues and concerns about um, uh, independent judiciary and they, those sort of things, it's just an image question, they're mistaken. Uh, this is also a very complex question. I, sure, I I'm do sorry, hope I'm that sure my op-ed. Sure, I, I do yeah, hope that I'm my op <laughs> opinion uh, Ed, will uh, this will appear next week in the Politico, where I also give a very detailed answer to this question. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think what's going on in the Council uh, is quite an unfortunate situation because uh, it was not the member states who wanted to initiate this. It was uh, the European Parliamentary past majority. Uh, here I come back whether there was actually a majority met legally or not. It was not the European Commission. I, I had several occasions to talk to personally to Mr. Timmermans, and he also openly and publicly said the European Commission College analyzed the situation in case of Hungary, and they decided not to launch Article 7 because they said they are separate legal cases which can be dealt with within the infringement procedure, and which is actually ongoing. So I, I feel sorry for also for the Finnish presidency because they are in a very awkward situation. Uh, they are you know, forced to deal with this case, which was initiated by a non-existent majority because if rule of law would really work or uh, worked in, within the institutions as well, you should read articles every day in Europe about the Hungarians' rights, which are not guaranteed because a fair procedure uh, requires legal certainty. 
And there is legitimate uh, reason why Hungary uh, actually challenged in, court of, uh, uh, in the court uh, of uh, Luxembourg uh, this resolution because the abstentions were not counted into the big packet. Mm -hmm. That's why the two-thirds majority was more easy to, to reach. And if you read carefully the articles before uh, the days preceding the vote, Ms. Argentini said, as Argentini said, that uh, she Dutch recommends. Member, Dutch member no, of she, she, yes, yeah. if, mm -hmm. well, I think everybody mm -hmm. knows her. Yeah. But, uh, I'm just saying. Maybe at, at least yeah. here. But, yeah. uh, so Probably. she yeah. recommended uh, hesitant maps mm -hmm. to take a coffee or go for a coffee while voting. It implies that she was also sure that abstentions are there to deteriorate okay, but, but, the but, ratio. But and but then we, they, they we actually debate, break the laws. We can debate the legalities uh, for a long time. And it is important because it should be fair, of course. And it, it, and it should it's be fair, but no one is talking about it. It's very important. So I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just repeating one point. Part of the question, you're right, it was a difficult question, there were several questions in it, but one of them is that um, um, the people who th say, um, either parliamentarians or um, uh, Timmermans in private, I mean, not as a commissioner, but he did say uh, things like, I'm really, really worried about the independent judiciary. Because he was a candidate for the Socialist Party, so yeah, it's but, politics. But yeah. so, so, he, so he's I, I would he have was said mistaken. the same things. Yeah. yeah, he was mistaken in the finish. He was using uh, for political there's purposes. No, there's, there's no reason to doubt the uh, independency of the judiciary. Look, in, if, in you, if you gave me the, the possibility for a one-day discussion, I could prove it for you. Mm -hmm. but of course, I'm trying to, okay. to no, do no, my you're, best. You're trying to but be uh, I think in yeah. Europe, uh, rule of law needs less political attention mm -hmm. and more legal analysis. So uh, this, is, this is key here. Okay. And, okay. and if, if we use this term without actually ever defining it, uh, then it is abused for political purposes. And you, you mentioned the MEPs, whether they were wrong. Look, I know how procedures are in the European Parliament because I have worked there. Believe me, there are only just a couple of persons who actually read this report. Mm -hmm. There was a big the political report, yes, there instance. was a big yeah, political yeah. hysteria around mm -hmm. it. Actually, I did my best because I really uh, made it from my heart because I was there to 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 prevent this from coming. And I had at least 50 interviews with MEPs, mostly from the EPP because EPP was key. We all know. And we were before the election campaign. Every country was about to set the list for the next European elections candidate. This was going to be a roll call vote, so everybody can check later on that. Uh, against this uh, enfant terrible, the rope, uh, how did you vote? So there was really politically a risk to, mm -hmm. to be brave enough uh, not to support the Sargentini report. And that's why I really made my best to read together with these MEPs the text, and I gave all the arguments, all the answers. And you know what? I got an answer for most of them. Look, I don't support the report. I didn't even read it. I actually don't really care. But I cannot uh, support Hungary publicly, so I can give you my abstention. And this is key here, because if abstentions had, have uh, counted, we couldn't have reached the two-third uh, uh, majority. So this is, this is, I think, here, this, this legal procedure. And uh, two, now- Two-third is quite a lot, though. Two-third is a lot, but it was not met. Legally, it was not met, because the treaty says two-thirds majority uh, must support and here, abstention of the votes cast. And in the European Parliament, you have three options to vote. If you don't want to vote, you are not in the room. So this is, this is actually a legal question. I, I know I, I'm, Mrs. Sargentini is intimidating, but not that intimidating, I think, <laughs> to actually prevent people from voting the way no, that they the, wanted. And this was a report that was very much debated. So I think people were exceptionally aware uh, of what they were voting. And we had been discussing it for many years. Uh, and I fully agree with you that you can, I mean, you can always disagree on, on details, interpret it. But I think if you look at the overall picture and the trends over the last 10 years, then we have to conclude, and it hasn't been concluded just by Mrs. Sargentini and some MEPs who didn't read the report, but by the Venice Commission, uh, by the European Commission, by uh, the European Court of Justice, uh, but, you know, by many independent instances that there, there is pressure on uh, the rule of law, on the independence of the judiciary, uh, pluralism of the media, uh, uh, freedom of uh, uh, academia, um, you know, so overall you can see there is a trend to, uh, to make it more difficult for dissenting voices, critics uh, and opponents to, to take the podium. Not that they are, they are outright banned or anything, but the, the, the measures compound uh, have this, uh, and have if, this and chilling effect. I asked you the same question I asked Minister Varga, um, how would you describe relationships between Budapest and Brussels, between European Union and Hungary? I think the, 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 the relations between the European Union and Hungary are very warm. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Hungary is actually 
almost literally in the heart of the European Union, if you, if you look at the map. Uh, it is a country that's made up of almost 10 million people, who that means 10 million different uh, opinions. Uh, you know, where people live in different places, they have different uh, views, different interests. Uh, what we have, uh, we have a dispute with is not Hungary or the Hungarian people. We mm -hmm. have a dispute with the government of Mr. Orban and even within Fidesz, because I think you're right. I mean, yeah, I've been working with Fidesz colleagues even, um, and, and this I would like to raise, because one, one point I think we might, we might concur. It is very difficult if one country is, uh, is, is, is targeted, because then you, know, you always get into a, a, a yes-no uh, debate, uh, is, is not. Therefore, uh, the European Parliament has adopted a proposal, and I have worked very closely with your Fidesz colleague, Mr. Schöpflin, uh, a proposal saying that all the member states should be uh, you know, monitored uh, uh, and, and, and reported on, on an annual okay, but basis. So, but funnily so, enough, Hungary is not in favor of that. So, uh, but I you see, but you're saying, I uh, uh, just want to ask a few questions, all three of you, and then, we, then I'm trying to, to, to bring you back into conversation, if I may. Um, because I just want to make clear, or want to be sure, you're saying, no, um, I mean, relationships are good, you know, it's in the heart of the European Union, but I'm just asking the same sort of question, I mean, the concerns of certain MEPs of uh, Judith Sargentini's mm -hmm. report and of, uh, of the Finnish presidency, so are, I'm just hearing that it's also um, misinformed or that it's no, no reason to, to be uh, concerned, but would you say there are real concerns? Well, if you, which are let's, the main let's, concerns let's, let's, let's start by your, your first question, the relations between uh, the Hungarian government and the European Union. I mean, I think that the European Union, you know, it's a big entity, uh, 28 Quite. member yeah. states still, European Parliament Commission, what have you. Uh, the, the Hungarian government is led by one man, Mr. Viktor Orban, who's actually been very loudly campaigning against the European Union. You know, he had this no. Stop Brussels campaign. I mean, that's the way he's been I addressing oppose. the European Union with, with very little warmth and very little respect. But from our side, yeah. I, I don't think and I mean, we've been critical. And, and your main concerns about um, um, uh, rule of law are... Uh, what, what would you say is in the Sargentini report? It's not, it's not just the rule of law. Eh? If you look at the European treaties, we have the so-called Article of, 2. Of, of is scientific council. The academia, uh, uh, pluralism of the media, independence of the mm -hmm. judiciary. Um, you know, in, in general, if you look at uh, uh, everyone who is critical of the government, I mean, it's funny to see that after the, the recent uh, local elections, <laughs> that the opposition parties worked together and they managed to, uh, to, to, to win the elections in a couple of cities, notably in Budapest. And it didn't take, what, two weeks uh, before a, a, a law is being proposed that will restrict the powers of local government. I mean, it's all just a bit, you know, it, it's all so clearly designed to, to, uh, to, 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 to quiet down or to shut up the, uh, the opposition. Another part of the rule of law uh, is of course, I mean, every country, we all have different political parties, different political views. In my country, for example, I mean, I belong to uh, D66, a liberal party, but we are in coalition government with the VVD, more conservative, Christian, the CD, CDA, Christian Democrats, and the Christian Union, which is, you know, ideologically quite far removed from my party. But we work together. Why? Because we respect and recognize all uh, the different viewpoints. But we all feel that a government has to serve all the people. Uh, and there, um, you know, I don't feel that Mr. Orban feels that responsibility. He is quite literally I serving oppose. his friends, uh, but on, only his supporter base. Um, and I don't think that's, that's good government. So you would think that, we, that the parliament should pressure on with an Article 7 Procedure? Well, an Article 7 procedure is a, a funny creature. It's, uh, it's, it's a long, complicated and heavy procedure for which there is no roadmap. Mm. And I think the most important thing, I mean, I would be over the moon uh, the day that the European Parliament decides, you know, this is no longer necessary because our concerns have been addressed okay. in, in Hungary uh, and, and in Poland, yeah. incidentally, because they're, they're two countries. Uh, so this is not about, uh, you know, it's not about punishment. Uh, I, I would really hope that 
uh, in which, debate with and, Hungarian and, and people will resolve. Which main concern could be taken away in that in that respect? You, one of your, your concerns. If you're saying, well, it's not about procedure, which of course it's not. It's not procedure for the procedure. It's it's about so which which main well, concern the, should the, be The thing addressed? is that it's uh, as I said earlier, there is the the impact of the the compound measures. If you if you uh, combine all the measures, you can see the chilling effect on uh, government critics uh, and opponents. Of course, another issue is, uh, and this is actually now put before the ECJ, because uh, you have to also admit that there have been a couple of rulings by the ECJ uh, uh, saying that the, the, the measures proposed by Orban have to be revoked. Uh, so one of the cases understand. that is now before the ECJ is about the, the treatment of refugees, uh, and notably the fact that they are kept in detention, um, but they don't get uh, sufficient food. I mean, that is yeah, something serious. Yeah. And a third, a, third, a third element is, uh, as the, the New York Times has recently reported, is it's not fraud, officially, uh, but it is the let's say, the use of EU agriculture funds, not for the farmers, but for oligarchs who are friends of The Orban. misuse of, fund, of European funding. Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's not illegal, um, but it's not what the, what the funds are for, actually. Before I go to the assistant professor, let's, let's see one, uh, one or two of the points, because... It should be very long, because... Well, basically, the, the, Europe, the European Court of Justice point you were, you were saying, because, because there was... Uh, the, the court said that refugees should be um, fed, isn't it? Yeah, and the... refugees are fed. These people, what we are talking, not fed, it's a bad word. They, they, are, they are given uh, food. Uh, it's food. a nicer way of putting it. Of course, agree. and yeah. it was not yeah. me saying yeah. this. No. So, uh, and no. we <laughs> are talking here about a very basic underlying legal question, whether uh, the situation in the transit zone, where there is a situation where you are free to leave this uh, place uh, f freely uh, on your own towards one uh, direction, towards Serbia, but mm -hmm. you are not allowed to enter the European Union before you are granted the, the proper papers, whether this uh, uh, qualifies as a detention. And the Strasbourg court is about to decide it, and it's still not decided. This is a, there is an ongoing case, Ahmed Ilyas case, and when, mm -hmm. as soon as it is decided, uh, then these court cases are decided. And when they are asylum seekers, they are granted food. Uh, because uh, asylum uh, seekers are uh, based on international law. These people, what we are talking about, who are, we are talking about, these were actually, after the end of the whole procedure, already ruled by court that they are not uh, uh, granted asylum and they have to uh, go back where they came home. Came, then they actually are under a different uh, procedure. And these also children, also the elderly, also the pregnant women are entitled to food because they have overruling uh, international rights. So this is also some kind of uh, bad framing, what mm. also uh, uh, gives a good news uh, in the news. But any other country who has faced the same situation, because we are there here at the Schengen border. We are defending the borders. It is easy to judge upon the situation in the middle of, of uh, Western Europe, where you don't face because this kind of Because you have a border country. Serbia, which yeah, is not a member. We have a border, Serbia, There's, this is not a member. Uh, Madame Infeld uh, actually just listed all these kind of concerns, uh, independence of judiciary, no media freedom. Look, uh, just please come to Hungary. Actually, 80% of the online media is so highly government critical. Actually, every day I get up, I get the press release, and 80%, 80% of, okay, you can, you can laugh, you can laugh, but uh, the most popular TV channel, the most popular news, the most popular newspaper, the most popular online sites, index dot. Age U, 444, HVG, HVG, 24.2, it's actually all these uh, online medium are highly government critical. So don't tell me there is no uh, access to free speech. That's, that's not to mention that's only the online media. And also the printed media, and also the access ratio. And look. Yeah, but the thing is, the thing is always, is it's, it's, it's always, I mean, there, of course, there is no law uh, in, in Hungary that is banning uh, critical media. There is a, does, law, there is a law guaranteeing the, the way, freedom you, of you, these media you, outlets. The thing is that I've seen, when it's, whether it's about uh, critical media, NGOs, or more recently uh, opposition parties, you make use of other instruments like tax laws, transparency laws, oh, that's, uh, you know, that's, fiscal that's arrangements, and it's, it's all meant, you know, it's, it has a chilling effect if you put it all together, because it cannot be a coincidence that, for example, the Central European University uh, has chosen... But it is still operating in Budapest, happily living. Yes, but it's not giving out diplomas anymore. Uh, I mean, it's all... Uh, as I said, the compound effect is chilling. It is. 
I, uh, I, I go to the, the oh. professor, we, and we continue this conversation uh, for, for quite a while because we're going to go into mm -hmm. uh, academic uh, independence and uh, media, of course. Um, yes. Of course, we're yes. uh, going to discuss that. It's in important uh, mm -hmm. issues, and um, um, uh, migration maybe as well. Um, 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 uh, I just want to turn to you, uh, uh, Professor Latso. Um, uh, if um, you're studying at, at one of the things you're studying you're writing about is um, European history, of course. And if you look at this conversation, I mean, if you look at the conversation between um, uh, Western European capitals or Brussels and Budapest, and you're a uh, Hungarian citizen as well, but you teach in Maastricht University, where, where would you say what, what, what needs to be done to, um, to put it in historical perspective? Is there, is there um, uh, uh, just misunderstanding or is it, how do you look upon that? Uh, right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for the invitation and also your kind words of introduction. Uh, I would say the relationship between Western and Eastern Europe is really complicated since 89, uh, since I think many people expected the two halves of the continent to converge over mm -hmm. time, to grow closer together, and that hasn't quite happened. I think there's still a lot of misunderstanding between the two sides, also misperceptions. There's also definitely a big gap in terms of level of development. Uh, the Netherlands is certainly a lot wealthier uh, than Hungary. Uh, and of course, there's also, I think, a problem that uh, the Western world after 89, uh, if I may generalize to a large extent, assumed that there's sort of an end of history, right? The famous Foucault-Mayen thesis. And that meant that the European Union wasn't quite prepared for the kind of challenges that some of the new, newer member states of the EU pose today, uh, right? Uh, they they uh, allowed countries to enter and there were no real mechanisms uh, to, to try to respond uh, to challenges posed by regimes that go off the track and go in an anti-liberal direction like Hungary and also to some extent like Poland has done. Uh, and I think that's, that's the situation uh, uh, that we're facing today, that in a way the EU has some instruments but probably doesn't have strong enough instruments uh, and doesn't quite know uh, how to relate to the challenge that's there on the ground. Mm -hmm. can, can, I, can I briefly respond to this? Because I, I only partially agree. Because you, again, speak in terms of countries. But countries are not homogenous. They're not monolithical. I mean, there are people in my country who think that Orban is fantastic. There are people in Hungary who, who think that D66 is fantastic. You know, and we can see, we can see in, in Hungary, we see in Slovakia, we see in Romania, we see in Poland. Uh, we see new, uh, let's say, progressive, so pro-European... Sorry? What's your comment on, on that? It's on not that? so. It's no, not so black and white. Okay, there's still you know we still have a different history, but it is converging more than it's. It's not a uh, you know the, the black and white caricature. So in in that sense, I think because the the debate inside Hungary is also much more diversified than we sometimes mm -hmm. uh, believe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, but uh, but. Um, um, the fact is that we have a conflict between uh, some institutions in Brussels and, and, and the government, the Fidesz government of uh, Orban uh, in, in Hungary. So there's, uh, yes, states are not monolithic, but we do have this situation, of course. Yeah, okay, but in the thing is, this happens a lot because, you know, member states, every day, the Commission starts infringement procedures against member states because of uh, violating the state aid rules, violating, uh, uh, you know, diesel emission rules, privacy rules. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is, of course, a, a specific issue, and this is about values. We call it the rule of law, but it's not a technical thing. It's about values, and I think it is good that Europe stands up for that. But that's what, what uh, uh, um, Professor Laszlo is um, saying as well, um, that maybe there aren't enough, I mean, that the union isn't, isn't quite equipped to deal with a lot of the, the issues arising uh, in a, in a multi, multiple sort of uh, union. So what would you say, what should be, what's lacking? Of, of instruments. More rule of law initiative. Well, I, I think, again, I, I partly agree with what has just been said, that, you know, it's, it's a compound of issues, right? It's, it's not just about, you know, media freedom or academic freedom mm -hmm. or a new electoral law or the way elections are conducted or the level of corruption or mm -hmm. the foreign policy of the country. It's all these things as a package. Right? I think the, the decline of the quality of democracy is what we're talking about <coughs> overall. And I think there are very strong indicators uh, in, uh, about that, how far 
the quality of democracy has declined in Hungary which over are, the past. Which are the indicators? For instance, if you look at press uh, freedom index, since you know the press was mentioned, Hungary is 87th uh, at the moment. Who, and, who and compiled this index? Sorry, which well, organization? It's, Do we it's, know uh, it? Yes, reporters across borders, oh, right? So yes. it's, it's uh, good, you can, good old organization. You yeah. can you can always criticize, of course, the uh, very the data. Neutral, very independent. Uh, uh, Right. I, I don't think there's any other country which has uh, declined in the ranking uh, to the same extent, uh, uh, and, and that's within the European Union quite unprecedented. So I think you have really a decline of democracy uh, in the country, and I think there I would want to return to the question of the relationship between the European Union and Hungary, because I think the relationship, have, the relationship has remained relatively warm and relatively cozy, and I think that also has its own downsides, right? Uh, academics have often talked about the constraining role of the EU, right? If a country would, you know, go off track, the EU would, would try to constrain it and bring it back to the, so to say, the right path, in quotation marks. But also in the case of Hungary, we've seen something quite different and something much more bother, bothering, I think, at least for me personally, certainly so, which is an enabling role. The EU has in many ways enabled uh, the Orban regime uh, uh, through subsidies, through also uh, protection by the European People's Party, right? Fidesz is, is, is officially a member of the largest centre-right, nominally centre-right fraction in the European Parliament. And you can ask the question the other way around. Would uh, Fidesz have managed to consolidate its power and concentrate power to such an extent without the European Union, without the legitimacy and without the, the material support of the European Union? You mean, and I think you that, mean the funding? Yes, the and, yes, and I because think the, the, the answer Hungary is no. Is a net <laughs> receiver of exactly, and, and very much so. So, you know, the, yeah. the, the economic success of the country, the economic growth we've seen in recent years, which is quite impressive, is directly connected uh, to, to, to European support, to European subsidies. Mm -hmm. Now, um, it's time to talk for me. Yes, go ahead, please. Thank, thank you, right. <laughs> it's and an interesting uh, point that actually the European Union helped uh, the, the Orban uh, uh, government to be in place. Um, you know, we are now dealing with the next MFF package, and there are very MFF, interest, the uh, multi annual financial framework, sorry, yep. and the next MFF package. And uh, there are interesting numbers because we are often dubbed like uh, the net receivers and the net beneficiaries. Uh, of course, there are a lot of countries who are not there yet sure. to be able to, to, to be strong enough to be net no. players, but we are That's heading. That's how the union works. This is our work. target. Sure. But if you look at the GNI, GNI the national. Uh, uh, gross national income uh, proportion of our payments and of our balance into the EU, we are actually contributing proportionally more than some net payers. So there are interesting numbers because of the rebating system, even those who are net payers, they can then also receive back through the back door, thanks to the uh, UK uh, agreement when they actually made the accession towards the EU. So this is actually uh, one uh, story. The other story, the cohesion has its logic. The cohesion uh, strong, uh, makes uh, convergence stronger. It may, it means that make the weaker stronger, that the whole community can be much more stronger. This is a situation where everybody wins. That's, that's how it was actually made up. And in a situation where both parties are winning, it is just not fair to blame one party by winning. So uh, we all know that each and every euro uh, spent uh, in Eastern, Central Eastern European countries in the GDP, it is uh, implied in the German GDP or in the Western European uh, investing countries GDP. So this is a, a mutually beneficial situation. So when uh, just blaming one country because of the uh, successful and sustainable use of EU funding, which is actually just a little proportion of our GDP, because believe us, we have a very successful own economic policy. And when we have problems, for example, with European mainstream, we always ask for uh, to be free enough to do our own way, because don't force those recipes, which you think, for example, from an economic point of view, is workable in the Western part. We think that we can have our own energy mix, our own economic mix, while also taking part in the cooperation. So I, I think most underlying questions are rather economical than uh, these untouchable, highly ideological, where I only see that all these rule of law chaos, which is, which is building up, completely misses the point because it is lacking all this uh, mutual respectful constitutional dialogue. You rightly mentioned that we are so different in our uh, institutions because we have different uh, historic uh, background, we have different uh, development where we get here. I could ask the question whether it is part of rule of law to have a constitutional court, yes or no, because there are countries mm -hmm. who have, who know. And then about transparency. When Mr. Timmermans is actually uh, shouting for more transparency when it comes to uh, the transparency register uh, issue uh, in Brussels, uh, this is the same uh, 
consideration behind the Hungarian transparency law. We never eliminated those funding, uh, uh, those NGOs getting the funding. This is only a national security interest, which is, I think, also exists in Holland, in the Netherlands, when you are also asking for more transparency from a public security point of view to see who is funding your civil society organizations from abroad. This is just about that. And it is not actually the uh, obstacle from getting this so, money. So, there are so, you, so many so you, details you would, you would, to discuss here. Uh, uh, and, yeah, we, and just one remark, sorry. When, mm -hmm. when uh, Ms. Infeld actually said that we will ask questions and we will check the situation if you are a good student or not, like, like whether uh, you, what, you ask whether what should we do in order to get rid of this Article 7. Mm -hmm. I think this is a syndrome here, what I'm experiencing for so many months and years now. Uh, whatever we answer, uh, whatever, how, how long explanation do we give when we prove that we are having the normal rule of law system in Hungary, because this is also part of our constitution, it is never enough. It will be never enough. It is a political so game, you, and they just won't stop it because it was started because of political reasons. But, but then, can I, ask you, can I ask you for support? Because uh, I referred to it earlier, the European Parliament uh, has made a legislative proposal, which the European Commission is now actually going to put into practice, for uh, a Europe-wide mechanism, an annual mechanism for monitoring uh, democracy, the rule of law, and fundamental rights in all the member states. Because then all the member states will be treated equally, and they all have to comply uh, with the same criteria. So I would suppose then that your government and that Fidesz will support such a mechanism because it will be fair. And if you say that you are attached to the same values, then you have to support the mechanism. Thank you very much. And let me give you a wider answer to this and to uh, put this into context. Because there were many initiatives on the table. We already have a no, no, an there effective, was one. There was no, one. We already have an effective rule of law dialogue based on the 2014 Council conclusions, which is a very sensitive consensus. That is, it was voted during the Italian presidency in 2013. This is a good direction where there are non-discrimination, there are equal footing for every member state. It is not a lecturing exercise, it's not a political tool. It is based on, on international and intergovernmental cooperation. And there was the Belgian and German law proposal, the, the peer review. Mm -hmm. This was initiated last year. This was uh, nearly the same based on the OECD exercise when exactly for these reasons, when there are uh, concerns, then let's check and monitor us, but in a mutual respectful way, not giving any kind of uh, political tool to the hands of uh, uh, to the European Commission or to any, anybody which is not based on this mutual uh, cooperation. Okay, but this is, you, know, you know that's a very weak mechanism. The, you're, you're avoiding the I, question. I your point you're, you're avoiding the yeah, question because, a little bit. No, I'm, 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 I'm coming to the point now. Which is, what is the question? The the European will, Commission you, will, you, will you support such a mechanism which is transparent? Because you now say you're now singing the this praise. This is transparent. You're now singing the praise of the, 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 the peer review and the, the dialogue within Council which is very weak, very weak. And the last time when it wasn't so weak, it was when Hungary was being questioned and you were furious about that dialogue. So, yes, you know, uh, why don't you support a mechanism which is treating all the member states equally and which is not a dialogue between member states behind closed doors, uh, I, I know but which why. is transparent and which will also allow Hungarian citizens to engage in the debate, not just the Fidesz, the government party, but all the citizens in a public debate. Uh, I know why you are hiding behind the Commission, because if it's about member states, I lawyer will. services, debating each other and blaming each other, this is a different story. And that's why not every member state actually is uh, signing up to this. This is the, the real uh, working of this institution because there were two member states, at least two member states, who actually had doubts about this kind of new tool. The European Commission made this exercise in a non-transparent way. When you have a new initiative, there's always an open website so that you can consult citizens on the new initiative. Interestingly, in the case of this initiative by the European Commission, we had to research for two weeks to ask the Commission where Hungarian government can actually uh, reflect on this uh, new idea. It was not published, never ever, on a public website by the Commission. It was only sent to secret email addresses of Which certain again, agents. You're, again, you're, you're, you're avoiding, you're referring to something, I find this yeah, a bit, I'm, I'm, I'm beginning referring. to get a little bit, you know, I'm asking a very straightforward question about something, I mean, you, you, I ask about a proposal of the European Parliament Parliament. And at first you answer by referring to the council, to, to the commission, things that people have yeah. no idea about. I'm asking you, would you support the principle of such a mechanism that is assessing every member state on the basis of 
equal criteria. Would you support that, yes or no? If this system is within the framework of intergovernmental cooperation, yes. But what so you that's are, a no, what then. You are, what you are, <laughs> yes, thank you very okay, much. But what clear. you are referring to, it's also circumventing the facts and a bit misleading the audience because they don't have any you know, detailed information about your proposal either. And this is the oh, problem. Yes, it's on the because website. when the Commission come, can come in, there is no treaty authorization for the Commission to confer any authority on it, to check any kind of uh, uh, legal situation in these members okay. is based so on this rule of law. You're not in favour of because, assessment then. Because, I mean, that's the answer. you are in breach of the treaty. This is why. And, you know, there were, there were operating and good functioning mechanisms which are now are wiped out. And member states are so threatened to say no. no you're you're anything, distracting. You're you really, you're there. really distracting I'm from the I'm issue here because. If I if I may step okay. in for I'm a sorry, second, I think part of I'm the asking. problem with Hungary is actually not so much the rule of law and the focus on the rule of law in a way. Uh, takes away the attention from something that is maybe even more important, and I'll try to explain what I mean. Uh, I think what Hungary has gone through is the rule by law. I think the constitution has been changed in a unilateral way, the electoral law has been changed in a unilateral way, uh, uh, and basically because of the two-third majority, the constitutional majority that Fidesz acquired in 2010 under completely fair and free elections, enabled Fidesz to concentrate power and to establish a system when it can get re-elected in free, but only, par but only partially fair or even unfair elections, and, and gerrymander the system in a way that it has a two-third majority, despite only being supported by a minority yeah. of the voters. That's what we have today. Yeah. And I think that, that what has been happening, you know, the European Union has been looking for a, a rule of law criteria. And of course, the problem in Hungary is that Fidesz doesn't need to violate the laws, because it can change the laws. It can rule by law. And we have a lot of examples of that, including the expulsion of the Central European University, which now operates in Vienna, uh, which has been the best graduate program in the country, but it has been expelled through changing the laws so that it could no longer operate in the country. Can mm -hmm. I say something about that? <laughs> let, 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 me to, let me come back to a few of, of those points, because it is a fact that the Central European University left uh, Budapest for Vienna, and they weren't willing to go, but they were forced to go. And then they went to uh, Berlin or to, to Bavaria because mm -hmm. there was this idea of, of establishing there. But no one is asking the question why German authorities did not manage to register the American accredited diploma. No, but because this would, was the but, only, but the only, you, only you issue. Would you agree that's very this uh, was the only uh, dramatic and actually a dramatic okay. thing for Hungary and for Budapest that a major university leaves? But uh, of the university left on its own decision. It no, it didn't. It, it was left on its own decision. And come, please come, uh, mm -hmm. the Central European University do exist in the in the Zrin, uh, which street uh, opposing the, the buzzing but, but Mike, Mike, still, Michael Ignatyev was is, here is uh, 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 about, 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 a, about a year ago, the rector of that yes, university, and he it. said we want to stay, but we're really forced out. But then You're saying it's his then. decision, but they said we have no other option than to go because yeah. we're not allowed to operate. Because they, they, he said this because he made politics of the issue right from the beginning. Look, there were other universities uh, complying with the new law. But there was a requirement. Look, Hungary is an ally of the United States of America. America, as far as I know, the United States of America has the best universities in the world, and you have chased away the only American university which has been issuing American degrees for almost two decades. That's rule by law. That's not rule of law. Rule of law needs consultation with the relevant players, and it also needs some kind of legal predictability. If you change the law on higher education, not to allow you know, institutions in, in Hungary to, to issue degrees of a foreign country which are accredited there, because the CU has always been accredited in the US, that's how it issued its degrees, then you're basically violating the right of that place to, to continue yeah. operating. That's a violation. This, this was a law which was not complied with, and other universities mm. could comply with it. Mm -hmm. And there was a requirement yeah, but that's to what, have that, a real education. That's what I said true. at the start. The point, is, the point is, you always, there, so you always well, pass, it's not, it's not you always pass mm. general laws. So, you know, you're not passing laws that target one university or one newspaper or, or one television channel or one NGO. The point is that the laws are designed in such a way that they will always affect one specific newspaper, one specific te television channel, one specific university, one specific NGO. They're designed in, in such a way. Or even, you're even saying they're custom-made for that 
Are you that Absolutely. what you're saying? Lex CEU, that's what it was yeah. called. Yeah. Yeah. I, I am happy and that everybody is so no, uh, and, and, no, no, I'm, I'm just happy. Uh, you know, and, and things like, like, like come on, if you, if you, if for for example, if you're you're saying, you know, two, two points. If you're if you're saying, uh, you know, we have fiscal laws that apply to everybody. Okay, fine, transparency laws that apply to everybody. But it's just a bit too obvious when just after an election where one of the opposition parties scored a victory, their offices are raided uh, because they're suspected of, I don't know, tax dodging or something like that. Come on, that is using the law to intim intimidate and harass an opposition party. Secondly, oh, to come back to the no, no, economic issue. Okay, I'll come back to <laughs> yeah. that the next <laughs> Because um, uh, uh, there, there are many points you address, and it's, um, but um, what um, uh, we're hearing now is that uh, there are some laws custom made for, for uh, Central European University or for a specific situation. There so are, the legs, There the are many international universities operating in Hungary, and there were others who had no problem and they didn't make any but political would, but case. But wouldn't you of say it. that it's in general very sad? Uh, uh, um, uh, if a very good university leaves your country. And what, if it's a very good university, why is it, he, is it making a problem of complying with the law? And by the way, we have an infringement procedure on that law. And uh, we are talking about here, you know, uh, the conflicting of two rights, the rights of a state to determine the structure of the upper education and the freedom of services. And we have all right to defend our position here. We are, we are here having a legal case. Why is academia? politics intervening into this legal situation? Because this is going on. Whole Article 7 is based on actually six or seven main infringement procedures. These are all open cases. In the name of rule of law, is it right? Is it a fair guarantee to intervene with politics? Well, with all the, all the burden of other member states to have we, a, a if, political if, if view on our legal uh, disputes. If we move from academic freedom, and we haven't addressed uh, the Scientific Council uh, uh, um, uh, issue, but if we, if we move to um, uh, um, another, another topic, um, if, we, if we can, because um, you, said, um, you said, well, we are f we're, we're, we're complying with um, uh, EU regulations on refugees because we have the Schengen border, and you do have, you know, Holland doesn't have a Schengen border, and you have, you have the Serbian border we do, actually. Uh, cross crossing in. So, so yeah, sure, and, and actually, border, if, you, if you are on the Schengen border, 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 border. You, have, you, have to, um, you have to protect it. So at, and actually, we are, if you fly to, to, to Britain, sure, if you, oh. but um, from, but... Um, um, then it's the same situation. But, the, yeah. but one of the, uh, one of the co uh, complaints is that um, Hungary is not willing to um, accommodate refugees, uh, the contingents which are coming from Italy or Greece, because of the common policy towards uh, the problems in the Mediterranean where uh, refugees uh, or migrants start to come into the Union. And Hungary is saying, well, and actually I quote from, uh, uh, um, from, from Orban, I think, if I can, um, if I can find it, um, that he's saying, well, he's, he's, he's basically saying that um, Hungary doesn't want to um, um, become a multicultural country because we want to remain uh, in the way we, uh, way we are. And what is the problem with that? No, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just wondering if, you would, if you're saying at the beginning uh, we're complying with European uh, 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 law and we think a stronger union is important, then if we have a common... Um, but this um, is not common. But if we have a common problem on our borders as the Union, and some people are, are, are coming in, we cannot leave them only to the Italians, because they have to... It's not about that. It is, um, you touched upon many issues, and it's a sovereignty issue to decide mm -hmm. with whom do we want to live on sure. our territory. Yeah. Multiculturalism is, is also another issue, because it was not among the rules of the communities to join it. No one ever uh, required us to comply with this requirement. It mm -hmm. is our sovereign choice what kind of culture and uh, future for our... Uh, country do we want? Mm -hmm. And when there are decisions made actually contrary to the uh, uh, will of uh, all the nations in Europe, like uh, this quota or relocation decision mm -hmm. was actually made mm -hmm. in quota. the infringement yeah. of the unanimous decision which was required by the European Council level, they made it a qualified majority decision contrary to the rules and then those countries who right from the beginning said that no we don't want to uh, accept this kind of uh, relocation system because we think it's a bad direction bad policy making mm -hmm. it's like an open invitation card to the world it means if there's a system for allocation it implies that you can come because there are open places for you and this is a bad message we didn't and never signed up for this policy 
But at the same time, we never criticize other countries by doing the same. So when other countries are having a different policy, mm -hmm. and there are consequences, why shall we also share this martyrdom of these consequences? We made our part. We uh, made the big uh, physical uh, uh, possibility of control who in which individual is entering the Schengen zone. Mm -hmm. this, is, this has cost a lot. And also, this is a big effort. This is also part of uh, the, the common defense uh, oh, okay. policy. But, but and this is also part of the f tackling the migration challenge. No, so I, I, t I don't I, think I, it I, is I, fair I, to force a country against its own sovereign will mm -hmm. to do something and then to sue it in court. But that's so but, what, so what are we talking about? No, 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 you, I understand your point. Orban said in uh, February 2018 from the speech, we must, say, we, must, we must say it, we do not want to become diverse in a way that we get mixed, our color, our traditions, our national culture get mixed with others, we don't want that. And that's, you're saying that's our sovereign decision, you know, we, we didn't sign up for this. So, yes. huh? so if others do that, um, we yeah, don't, so we if, just want it. Yeah, don't and, want and please it. let us alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I mean, that, that, that point is, of course, um, uh, uh, taken. But if you say we're in, we, together in the Union, we have several um, uh, problems which we're trying to deal with it together, like the, the border with uh, Northern Africa and the border with, with, with um, uh, the Near East. So if um, you have a common uh, uh, guarding um, uh, a guard on the, the borders. You have a common policy of um, resettling the people who get, who coming in and not leaving it only to the Italians or the Greeks. But we always Isn't said it? we take part in this common effort. Mm -hmm. The way we can accept it in accordance with our sovereignty, mm -hmm. and we always uh, bring help. For example, we also give uh, a lot of uh, help for Serbia to to tackle the migration challenge, mm -hmm. and we also. Uh, uh, send a lot of money through the Hungary Helps program to so, so be saying, able to, so you know, we're locally we're part, tackle. We're not, we're not taking in any yeah, because, migrants or refugees. Yes, yeah. because this is this this uh, decision of a sovereign nation should be respected and not sued for that. Okay. But isn't it true? This is so simple. The, uh, Hungary so? Hungary is a member mm -hmm. of the European Union. It has signed up to the EU treaties. As a matter of fact, in 2009, Hungary was the very first country to ratify the Lisbon Treaty. Yeah, but this is not the very about first. And in the treaty, it reads, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's chapter five, I don't even know by heart, it refers to the common asylum and migration uh, policies. I mean, it's laid down in the treaties. It's been there for, for 20 years already. So it's about I, I suppose, I presume, I presume that when Hungary joined, you know, you read the treaties. So this is not about sovereignty. This is about your treaty obligation that you entered into voluntarily. The point is, though, Hungary doesn't have an immigration problem. It doesn't. You have an emigration problem. The, the point there are more people leaving. You have a no, net. You have a, a net. You summer, have a net. More people are coming. You home. have a net emigration. You have a. The you have. You have. The a, you have. Look, the, and that's not that's not unique for Hungary. But there is, is there is you? there is because this is Central European problem. It's not it's not unique for Hungary. I was going to say there are more countries, in particular in Central and Eastern Europe, where we can see population decline. We also see, and there Hungary is really uh, uh, you know uh, very uh, low in the ranking, that the uh, life expectancy is lower. Uh, there's population decline. Uh, in many, so there is no immigration problem. Besides, besides, if you look at the recognition rates of asylum seekers, in most countries it will it varies around, let's say, 40 percent. Hungary, 7 percent. I mean, so there is no immigration problem. So isn't it true that Orban is simply using this whole issue to mask uh, other issues that, you know, to, he's deflecting the debate uh, away from this. I mean, the question should not be why do immigrants want to come to Hungary or to Europe? The question should be why are there hundreds of thousands, mainly young people, leaving Hungary? Highly educated people. This why is, do they not think so that in Hungary and why in, in Hungary they have sorry, enough but This is so, what, so distorting. What's, and, and what's distorting about the, the... This is distorting. First, uh, the common uh, migration policy never actually when we joined the EU and the whole uh, common Aki, Aki Komnoter, never uh, con included this allocation uh, mechanism, never uh, signed up we, to this. And it was not ever Actually, among the, the rules. It is about checking the Schengen system. And if you talk to Frontex soldiers or Frontex officials, they are all satisfied with the, with the performance of the Hungarian policemen. So, Please don't mix up here laws and Aki Komnoter with, with something much you. more different mm -hmm. thing, which is about the future of Hungary and the European culture, which is a historic challenge now what the whole Europe is facing. And we have a different answer to that. So all what we need here is tolerance and respect, mm. nothing else. Can I ask you another question? Because you're, you're, you say this is about national sovereignty, so basically you don't accept 
uh, that there is a majority voting in the area of uh, asylum and migration. So, um, although that's in the treaties. Now, let's say that we, we stick to sovereignty and national vetoes in every area, including EU funding. What do you mean by huh? EU funding? Would you, would, you think, would you think that the solidarity between the member states would be the same if we decide everything by veto? Because there is, you know, We Hungary, only decide Hungary. where there is a room for veto and there is a big infringement of national interest and there is a place no. for veto. You know, Look, believe there was me, a, there was but a, there, there was, was a big a member state who actually vetoed quite recently on a very, very important issue. And no one is asking any questions about that. Yes, I am actually very critical of the countries that have vetoed. For example, the Why? It's only, the only you know, on this fixation. Look, this, this is the funny thing. Yeah, just you're, using the tools which are legal. You always go like, oh, you know, why us? I mean, ask the people of my party, we're in government, eh? my party, D66, we're in government. I'm probably the most critical person uh, of the Dutch government when it comes to many things. I mean, I think that's a healthy thing, actually. Um, you know, and I'm criticizing lots of other governments as well. I find that's my job as a member of the European Parliament. So I also criticize the Hungarian government. It's healthy. It's part of democracy. But I would like to uh, hear your views on termination, the referendum, for example, here in the Netherlands, which is actually one basic element of democracy. Why it was actually terminated? If we Hungarians would have done the same, there would be so many sanctions against well, us. You, you, oh, no, 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 you no, said, no, 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 we're not going into this. You're no, no, not I'm not going to say anything about you're not a the referendum. Of the, of the, of I'm sorry, the, but this is, this is also you know, part Brussels of uh, democracy. But she had another point, no, not can, about the referendum. We can go into many, many, many different directions. We're not debating The Hague. No, no, no. Yeah, because we are always debating Hungary. Well, that's the fashion. I'm not saying anything about the referendum. All I wanted to say is you're absolutely right that there is no country that's perfect. And it's also right that there are you know, different ways of meeting the democratic standards. You referred earlier to the absence of a constitutional court. I fully agree with you. you know, I would like to have a constitutional court in this country. The difference is, if you look at, uh, at the Netherlands, uh, for example, well, going through this whole exercise go of looking... <laughs> no, no. I'm, no but, yeah, but this is my point. Out. Why don't we talk about these things? Because what we are talking about here in Hungary, that we there is a, a very successful party which actually gained a consecutive third term. And now when the opposition is not winning, then they are actually blaming uh, rule of law, yeah. etc. And look at, we had local elections. Mm. Then they gained a uh, win, victory. They, they, Democracy they talk, is working in Hungary. Press, it's flourishing. Law, yeah. but, but, you know, we are talking about the, freedom. The, you know, it was Ryan Hees from Politico, the elections were free, who, who but told were they me fair? that don't believe, don't believe that uh, Hungarians are not able to, to have enough information about their free choice. So it's, it's actually a distortion of the I, I, facts. I don't think the professor I, agrees with, with that. Yeah, because the professor... I wanted to, uh, to re return to the question of, you know, does Hungary have the sovereign right to decide in this way? Yes, absolutely. Hungary has the sovereign right to decide. So. Was it right to decide this way? No, it wasn't. So Why? there's a substance Why? to the issue. Uh, because Why? I think one should be compassionate, one should show solidarity, but also with its European uh, allies, and also with the people who are fleeing war and violence. And I think what Hungary has done, and it has really shocked me, I have to say uh, very honestly, it has really shocked me that our, uh, the prime minister of the country I come from declared that diversity is bad, and he wants an ethnically homogeneous country. Oh, I am a historian of modern Hungary. I am a historian of modern Hungary, and I know that the ethnic relatively homogeneous country we have has come about through territorial change, through persecution of minorities, through expulsions, through genocides. And when you defend this principle of ethnic homogeneity, you're in a way endorsing a politics uh, that, much, that, 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 that was, uh, and that's very, that's very recent. We're not talking about, you know, 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago, we're talking about the experience of living generations. Uh, so I was deeply shocked, and I must say I was already here in the Netherlands, and no policy of the Hungarian government discredited Hungarian people more in the West than that one. Because thanks to these kind of speeches like you are giving. Because uh, actually, this is the problem, but I think you went too far with this historic uh, parallel because it has nothing to do with the, uh, the current situation. You know, so, Hungary had 42% of I, ethnic Hungarians in the, at the beginning of the 19th century. 42%. We are a country which, which is in the middle of a very diverse region of Europe. It ha, it, many different people lived there who spoke many different languages, had many different religions. Now we have an, a homogeneous country, like most of Eastern Europe is homogeneous because of this very violent process of reducing complexity, reducing Not diversity. Oh, no, I think we are now hitting here a big cultural debate, and sure, I think it, this debate is not about Hungary or not about the Netherlands. It's about the future.
Central of Europe. And I ask the question whether it is a default value in Europe to be liberal and to be in a constant progress. And why those countries? Who would like just to preserve the status quo, mm -hmm. like being conservative, being Hungarians, with all these historical uh, background? Because, of course, Hungary is at the crossroads or the, the channel between East and West. And, of course, in our uh, minorities, we also, what, who we actually respect in our national constitution, they are a uh, state-forming part of our nation. But it's a completely different situation what we are facing today, because there are big mess of, of constant inflow that which, which would be forced on us to accept on. We are here in a complete misunderstanding of the facts and the situation. And now, if you say that it is a, it is a precondition to be part of the European Union to fully uh, sign up for multiculturalism, I say no. It but was not among the But why do you want to be in the Schengen zone? Why we do you want right to be in the Schengen to zone if you, if you want to ethnically homogeneous country? Why do you want to allow your people to even to migrate around the Schengen zone and mix with other people if you want an ethnically homogeneous country. But I it, never understood that. It's, a, it's an absolute contradiction. You know, there are, there are words which are not allowed to say in Europe anymore. And I think freedom of speech does not exist in Western European uh, media anymore. Because at the, when a European politician uh, tries to speak by heart or, or naming the truth, no me an shah and shah, then he is immediately stigmatized mm -hmm. and discredited, oh, and, and, especially on migration. Oh, there that, are look, so look. many. I could quote also from one of your politicians and that's, uh, and that's, what happens. But you know, I am Hungarian and I am a migrant, so you know, opposing no, the two is to, a bit of a problem. To, to us, yeah, it's happening to us because, but you know, we are, you know, we are not afraid because you, it, you is, it I, is so good to good feeling to name the truth as it is. Look, you, you and you it's not I, being I'm, I'm, against I'm very, anyone. I'm it's very just, grateful that we're having this debate because there are not that many opportunities to actually have a debate with Fidesz politicians. So I'm, I'm, I'm sincerely grateful. But what, I, what, I, what, what irritates me is that uh, I see the same pattern all the time whenever there's criticism uh, and you get caught, well, not, not you personally, but your party gets cornered and there are no answers anymore, you start to play the yeah, victim. This is also very Saying, oh, why us? Oh, there's no free you. speech anymore. Oh, we can't say anymore. That's not true. Come on, have a debate and defend what no, you stand I, for. I, I and yes, we have a different... I didn't say this. So in a way, you're accusing each other of the same patterns, um, uh, which sounds because like, sounds like a bad pattern. marriage, doesn't it? No. <laughs> no, I think... I think uh, if you if you say to each other that it's always the same pattern of reaction but of, of look, may I ask a question from all of you? Mm. Uh, why we are a hung, we are a country of ten million with a humble GDP with twenty thousand soldiers. So we really know our position and our power, which is which is in proportion to world powers or bigger member states. It's, it's it's not really uh, dominant. Why are we always on your agenda and on many politicians' agenda? Why don't you deal with, with other challenges in oh, Europe? Because I'll, I'll tell you why. Because first of all, the European Union is a community of values. It's laid down in Article 2 of the treaty. Which are also in it's our not, constitution. It's not, it's not, and those, those values, and as the European Union is developing and becoming a more political union, those values become more important. But these values important. are also part and of we, our when we have, when we make life. Common policy, when we make common policies, uh, like asylum and migration, you know, how do we deal with refugees? When we have external policies, what's our response to, I don't know, to Trump, to, to China, to, to Syria, do yeah. we okay, military... But, but you, do that, you do that let's, on the basis... Take, you do that. Can I one, finish my sentence? One sentence shorter. Yes, yes. Go ahead, please. Do, we do that on the basis of, uh, of joint values. So it's very important to have that debate. And of course, there are different values within Hungary, I think and because Hungary is not a monolith. So, My so, country so, is not so a we, monolith. So, we, so we, we we're getting, an, I mean, you're, you're right, this is an important part of the political debate, maybe not of the legal debate, maybe not the legalistic debate, but of uh, politi political Absolutely. decisions about uh, homogenetic nations or not, about but migrants or not, um, and you're saying it's a political discussion, and if we raise it, we're, it's very simplified, we're, we're being um, uh, uh, ostracized, we're being, huh? we're being um, but would you agree um, on the on the f on the on the fact that indeed Europe is also uh, about values, and you're saying yes, that's the values we we incorporate. We share in our these values, and so we, would you we say live that with these a values. debate on those values and where the um, is valid and is and is, is important. On of, where of course, we are living with these values. We are we are actually it, it's like water and air mm -hmm. uh, in every country in Europe. So just always questioning the values because. I don't like the political decisions or I don't like the government in a country. I think it's a misuse of these values. Mm -hmm. 
So just uh, denying of these values from a, a political community because it is successful in a conservative way in a country, I don't think it's a good uh, debate here because it's, it's not a balanced debate. It's like always lecturing, always lecturing, and you say that uh, if I, I don't give an answer, but I think I give an answer, you say that I'm, I'm uh, deteriorating the situation. I'm not deteriorating it. I'm just trying to tell you what I think it's all about. There is a part of Europe which just cannot swallow that there can be a successful government who can gain two-thirds victory, yes, on very normal electoral law. If this same result would be in the UK, we would have 85% majority. And the law was amended because of the Venice Commission requested it because there was 300 percent differences in each and every little constituencies. So actually, the, uh, the Venice Commission requested the change so you, to the electoral law it back was in a 2010. Un unilaterally introduced law by a single party. When? After 2010. Yes, because of the Venice Commission asked <laughs> to make it this balanced. Look. So we Hungary could also, is one of the then, least then balanced check, electoral laws in Europe and, since Fidesz changed it. But look, there are also countries in Europe where if there's a, a very, winner very just with 50% before. or just uh, the biggest majority winner, then they get extra 60 uh, seats. But that's so, true. You sure, know, sure, it's, it's but, not Hungary, for example. Yes, so it's but, again but, double but, standard. But, Let's no, have a it's not because legal, the, the, uh, the government changed the electoral law it's in its own favor. And, and you could see it exactly at last year's election that Fidesz got two third majority with less than 50% of the vote. What I saw last year's election, that the opposition was not able to be successful and yes, they were frustrated. This is only thing. This is happening. This is democracy. There is there, there are similarities and there is a difference. Because yes, you're you're right. I mean you can look at many other countries, you know, that are not perfect, where the electoral system is not perfect. We can see how the Brits are are, are grappling. We've been uh, debating uh, that quite often. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> So you're right. The, the the problem doesn't lie there. The problem is is also not in the fact that we may belong to different political families and we have we have different uh, different viewpoints on things, even even culture and, and values. The point is that there is a very deliberate policy uh, throughout a very wide range of areas, which compound have a chilling effect and which make it much more difficult for the opposition, for free media, for academia, for NGOs, uh, you know, for other parties. And that is so. I'm, and, and that is a deliberate policy. And there are some objective, would, would, would you, would neutral you, would standards. Would you agree that it's a deliberal, deliberate policy? Yes. Deliberate. A deliberate policy. What to, do you mean? To to um, make it um, uh, more hom to to make Hungary more homogenous and more difficult to overturn elections? No, not at all. There is a democratic uh, rule uh, prevailing in Hungary, mm -hmm. and if the opposition and the opposition leaders and politicians are. I don't know, successful, then they can gain victory. This is about democracy. Mm -hmm. why, why it is not acceptable for Europe that mm -hmm. there can be a country where there can be a successful government? Because this I see uh, coming, actually. They just cannot swallow this. Because it is, for example, in Belgium, they never saw such a, su such a big majority. And, and you know, the, the voters, they, they are happily living. And the majority said, OK, this policy, what this government is doing is right. And then it's OK. And then we win, the, we win the election. Next year, or in 2022, we will have to fight, for the, of course, for the voters again. But this is the political but, but, but no, 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 situation. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to get to a close and to go to the, to the, the audience as well. Um, um, so if we get to the last point uh, um, uh, the professor made, um, he's, he's saying a homogenous Hungary was never there. It's, it's too bad that we, that we now want it. And would you, I mean, if you listen to Orban's quotes, or um, wouldn't you agree that maybe if you belong to a minority in Hungary, either be Slovak, I or would have more rights than, for example, in other countries, uh, or, or Roma, or um, wouldn't you think that um, uh, pointing at a homogeneous country or a population? Would be quite terrifying for Slovaks, Ruthenians. I think Jews. this question, sorry, this question is so provocative that I, I, I hardly can answer it because mm -hmm. it, it is really uh, not necessarily uh, uh, should be so provocative. Because in Hungary we have a minority law mm -hmm. which uh, provides so full minority rights for members of uh, a group mm -hmm. of minority, be it uh, uh, Rusin, be it uh, Roma they can form their own government, not only locally, but also in a county level and also in the whole national level. We even provide much more minority than other very modern member states, which I wouldn't count here or quote here. So if I were a minority member in Hungary, I would be happily living as a normal Hungarian uh, citizen or a people, those who are living in, in the territory of the country. It is not about that and just distorting the meaning of homogeneous. It's so shocking for me to hear because you are, I know what you are pointing at, whether we would you know, just uh, 
repress uh, or push uh, those uh, minorities with, with no rights, but they have you know, the highest standards of the minority rights in Hungary. We've been living with these minorities for decades and for centuries. They are actually part of our state. It is not about, this debate is not about that. But we are always saying that we know what the Hungarian culture is, also including a lot of diversity of its, if, of its historic minorities. It's not about it. It is now about this artificial exchange of population, which is actually forced on Hungary by the relocation and also all this migration policy, which is actually a cultural question. And that's why Prime Minister Orban once said in migration policy in Europe, the only thing which we need is not a consensus primarily, it's respect and tolerance. Yeah because we all have different historic experience about migration. Hungary never experienced actually what your country experienced to invade other nations or other countries or exploit those countries. We had only the experience that we were exploited, we were invaded, and we had no. to live under a lot of oppression. Mm -hmm. So we have different uh, historical every, experience. Every and actually, Europe never experience. talks about this situation. And so uh, that's why we cannot uh -huh. ever have a real cultural consensus on the approach towards migration because yeah. we but have one thing you cannot say. One thing is just not not accurate what you're saying. We can have a long debate about diversity and, and homogeneity, but one thing is simply factually wrong. Nothing is forced on Hungary. Uh, Nothing. You're a member of the European Union and as such you are at the table when laws are being passed, when, and when, are when treaties are table being when, qualified that, majority. That's, nothing's yeah. being circumvented. With everything everything is, is going according to the treaties which you have signed up to. It's just that you don't like the result. But that's something else. It's, it's Nothing better. is forced on you. The, everything is forced on us when, because for in, <laughs> in these big crucial issues it was forced on us. The relocation quota was forced on Hungary because it should have been an unanimous decision, but they actually made it to they, be a council decision, decision at a lower level so that it became a qualified majority, and you all know the rules, how this European uh, Union is yes, functioning. There was a qualified crisis. majority cannot be blocked by one member state or by two member states. Let me quote just a very, very uh, different example, posting of workers directive. There was crucial interest of the Central European countries to prevent this uh, directive to be adopted. And 12 of us was not enough to block this. And it is actually infringing upon very crucial basic interests of our countries when actually they are patronizing Western European interests. And we were there yes. at the table, as you rightly said, yeah. but it was such an unfair situation where we were not able, even if we tried hard, to prevent this from coming. So that's why I just cannot accept you saying that you are at the table and you, you signed but up to the rules. Totally In migration, right. we should have unified You're, you're totally decision. right that there is, there is uh, uh, unfair treatment in some, some policy areas of the, let's say, the post-2004 countries. That's absolutely right, and I think we should address it. I think also in our country, we should be much more aware the of the, 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 thank you for Central that. The Central and Eastern, European Eastern, mainly Central Eastern the, European yeah. countries. So you're, you're absolutely right. There has been unfairness when it comes to freedom I of I appreciate your of statement. Work. Thank you very much. No, but you know, I've, been, I've, I've, I've even written about this. So I think you're, you're absolutely right. But solidarity, I mean, we all ultimately have to agree. And solidarity goes both ways. And I think when it is about, indeed, welcoming people in need, fleeing from a war in Syria, then, you know, uh, if we... Th then th the most important thing is, you're, you're always talking about Christian values, is to do your Christian duty, your charity, welcome those people, protect those people. There were 160, 160,000. Are Christian, Christian values a part of the European Union? Uh, I do hope so. so. You, do, you do hope so? I hope so, but look, it was actually, actually prevented do, do from the constitution. So? Partly? Of yeah, look, I'm not a Christian, but okay. of course this is... It's this a culture. Is, okay, yeah. it's, okay. It's, it's, it's interesting remark because you're on different sides of political spectrum in that respect, but if you both oh, think... But it's this also something um, underlines the, the statement of a big wise man who said even in Europe, even the... The atheist is a Christian because you are living in this Christian uh, culture. Well, yeah. <laughs> you look at the, the having, architecture, having, you look at the We're having a debate with Tom Holland, who just wrote Dominion, a, a British historian who said that, but we're having that in January, so if you're interested in that, do come back in January, uh, because that's exactly what Tom Holland uh, argues in Dominion, um, uh, which is also a very interesting debate, I would say, on the Christian values and which values of the European Union. Uh, we have been debating some of those values in practice uh, uh, here, and I'm also looking uh, at the 
another uh, European value, which is uh, participation of the audience. <laughs> <laughs> if, if there's anybody who uh, uh, would, would like to comment, I try to get to you. I'm sure we can't um, uh, uh, get to everybody, but I will try to do my best. Um, 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 uh, maybe uh, here, 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 here. First, would you just? Uh, I, I keep the microphone, and okay, if you okay. just. Um, my name is um, Kees Terik. I'm the president of the uh, European Network for Councils of the Judiciary, of which the uh, Hungarian uh, Council is a respected uh, member. Uh, I have a, a question about the successor of Mrs. Tunde Hando. She was a known to, whom? To, to the minister. To the minister. Okay. Yep. Um, it is known that she uh, did not, uh, she ignored the, 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 the position uh, of the Hungarian Council, uh, of the judiciary, and my question is, would she support a, su a successor who, who does respect these rights of this council? A, a very detailed question, but... Uh, can I? My new, yes, please. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, Ms. Tunde Hando uh, was presiding the National Office of Judiciary, and uh, she's been a very successful president of this office. She actually introduced Hungarian courts in the 21st century. I myself, I worked in court, and uh, it was really need. Uh, there was a big need for modernization, and it's a lot of uh, you know challenges when it comes to. Uh, try to lower the burden of each judge when it comes to the number of dossiers, when it comes to a lot of projects to fulfill as regards digitalization and modernization. So she made a lot of a tremendous big job. And uh, now, uh, as you said, that ignored uh, the, the council, because I, of course, I'm very much aware of the news, what you hear from the Hungarian judiciary, and most of these news are the basis of your statement that no independence of judiciary. So let's talk about the independence issue. Uh, myself, as a justice minister, I have not at all no authority over anything in the judiciary in Hungary. They are completely autonomous bodies, and the whole structure is actually adopted and accepted by the Varzo Commission at that time, even the Venice Commission. We have the stamp paper from European institutions that we are really compatible with all the EU values. Not to mention that in other countries, uh, among that also the Netherlands, the justice minister has at least budgetary powers over the judiciary. Here in Hungary, the budgetary line is also a separate line for Hungarian courts. So they are all based on the autonomous local governing bodies. And that's how the National Judicial Council is also uh, established. They are uh, elected through electoral system and they are uh, presided by the head of the Supreme Court who is elected by the uh, national uh, uh, parliament and also the head of the judicial office is also elected by a two-third majority of the national parliament. So it is out of the executive. And since there were, during these eight years, a lot of personal conflicts, because throughout your management activities, of course you end up in having lots of lots of conflicts, because you are, of course, infringing on many uh, interests when you know, judges are required to uh, provide more statistical data throughout their working, etc. So there were internal personal conflicts. It has nothing to do with the independence of the judici judiciary. And I do believe that you, as a judge, who having uh, maybe more connections to Hungarian judiciary, please uh, try also to ask other judges, not only those who have some personal uh, conflicts or whatsoever. And I don't want to judge upon the situation. I only want you, you to be neutral in this uh, question and not politicize the situation. So uh, Tunde Hando has a different interpretation of the status of this National uh, Council. In Hungary, there is an ongoing uh, constitutional court case to determine this situation. But I do hope that the new successor will deal with the situation. And what I only hope for is peace and consolidation within the judiciary. And I'm not fighting for a lot of uh, increase in their salaries, because I think in Hungary judges are really underpaid. Uh, we are lagging behind at the end of the list of the, of the payments. And I think what judges are needed, it's a well-paid job, a very respected well-paid job with peace. So please don't mix up with politics into the Hungarian judiciary, because it is really damaging, it's very detrimental, because it makes any kind of uh, perception for Western European leaders and readers of the newspapers as if any kind of intervention would be from a political side. It is, it is, it is nothing uh, to do with that. As an executive, we have no authority over that. Unlike other countries where, for example, judiciary is under the authority of the uh, justice minister, at least. I could quote at least one third of the member states. So uh, thank you very much for the question. And, uh,
uh, we, we do hope that we will be very successful with the increase of their salary because I think this is what they also deserve. Thank you very much. Another question here, somebody. Hi, I'm uh, uh, June Plas. I'm uh, studying and working here in Amsterdam. Um, I, I, I don't agree with uh, Hungary's treatment of the refugees uh, on their border. However, um, shouldn't we also be looking at, for example, Italy or Spain um, that obviously uh, pay large amounts to uh, either governments or uh, uh, militants in North Africa to keep refugees out there? So, in a way, th it, it, it feels like they're doing a, a, a similar thing to Hungary, but because it's, it's outside of Europe's borders and because it's in, in, in North Africa, there is not the same attention paid to it. So it, it does sometimes feel like, in, in, in this case, perhaps a slight double standard. No, towards that's you asked this, you asked this to, to Sophie yes. yeah. it's, I think it's also a bit off topic, but uh, I can reassure you just this afternoon, we had the umpteenth very emotional debate in the European Parliament precisely about uh, the treatment of refugees, in this case uh, in the camps uh, on the Greek islands. Uh, but we have been debating the funding of uh, camps in, in Libya. We have been extremely critical in the European Parliament. I mean, across the board, left-wing, right-wing parties, of the total failure of all the member states collectively, including my own country and Hungary and other countries, to adopt a decent, humane, and effective asylum and migration policy, and I very much hope that that will happen. But there we make no distinction, but the fact that it happens in several countries doesn't mean that we cannot address specific situations. But we okay. look at all Thank the situations. It's a good idea, actually, uh, uh, to check others as well, not only talking we do. about Hungary. I do hope we're so. Actually, we're so talking much. a whole lot more okay. about Greece and Italy than Hungary I, I in this respect. I have another question here. I, 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 there's more, many more people who wanted to come in. So, uh, Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Julia Ivan. I'm from Hungary. I'm Hungarian. I was the director of Amnesty International Hungary in the past two years when the infamous Lex NGO 2017 was adopted by your government. And you mentioned that it was necessary for transparency reasons and also because NGOs pose a national security threat. Uh, and not, I would like you to NGOs. elaborate on that. You've said this in this debate but, uh, this the, evening. And let me finish just my okay. question. That would Thank be you, very kind is, of you to allow me. Thank you. Um, so that um, your government, while adopting this law, never actually presented any of these um, allegations, so there is no evidence, while Hungary is in an infringement procedure, which you deem as the appropriate measure to deal exactly. with, um, is facing at the Court of Justice in Luxembourg um, the whole European machinery because this law is not compatible with EU laws. So please elaborate on that. And just one other question, tiny one, promise, is that um, how is it compatible with your European values, Minister Varga, to name and call your opponents in debates like NGO leaders and NGO workers and activists the enemies of the state and blacklisting them on pro-government pro journals like Fidelo Journal, like my friends, my colleagues, professors, academics were blacklisted and intimidated. Is it compatible with EU values in your views? So Thank nine, you. Very nice. Thank you. Very nice provocative question, actually. And let me add that there are 60,000 NGOs actually operating in Hungary, and uh, most of them are actually very satisfied with the situation in Hungary. Actually, I never said this statement like enemies, so please uh, don't put it into my mouth. But just your your tiny little uh, late question. Uh, thanks for coming up with this NGO transparency. Uh, Law, because we have an infringement procedure. And before this infringement procedure, we were also in a constitutional dialogue with the Venice Commission, and they had recommendations, and we implemented them uh, out of five, at least uh, uh, three or, or two of them. So, and it is not a must to comply all, all these uh, five recommendations in general in Europe. So we have a legal debate here. And in this legal debate, we have all the right to defend our position from a legal perspective. And we are using all European parallelism, like the transparency register, like the transparency uh, requirement here in the Netherlands. And I never said that NGOs are a threat to national security. No, the phenomenon of foreign funding of NGOs may, this phenomenon, not the NGOs, the phenomenon of foreign funding may cause uh, a case for a uh, national security issue, which is actually here the, also in the but Netherlands. Yes, the, the, what do you mean, never prove it? Because, because 
you know, if there's a national threat and national security issue, first of all, it is, it is not a public issue at all. But, you know, it is not obstacle to get your money. I don't what? understand why 150 NGOs had no problem in registering and complying with this law. Among them, there are many different uh, activity type NGOs. It was only these very few NGOs which actually highly made it a political situation. And I always advise for these NGOs who want to be active politically, why don't you uh, establish a party and why don't you play this game according to the party transparency rules? Because if it's, if, it's a, if it's a party and political uh, messaging uh, exercise, then there, there are uh, legal framework for that. So this is actually just a requirement, which is requirement mm -hmm. in any other countries but across does, the world. Would you, would, you does, agree, would you agree with the part of the statement, and, and I heard that before by other uh, uh, people who work for NGOs, that they felt threatened by uh, uh, the public opinion and by the Hungarian government I don't want to NGO. comment on that because if they just say it, of course mm -hmm. you will believe them. So what, what can I say? Mm -hmm. Of course, it is, there's no chilling effect. Other hundreds, would, would of, hundreds, would, hundreds of NGOs have no regret, chilling effect. Would you regret that if, if that would be the case? Of, of I, re I regret them feeling this because mm -hmm. there is no legitimate reason to feel that. And there are 60,000, 60,000 NGOs operating. But what in is Hungary, foreign funding? And, and only What's a few funding? of them are spreading these these uh, fake news about this kind of chilling effect. So, um, but I'm is sorry. foreign funding uh, also uh, by the Norwegian government, by the EU, or by Mr. Soros, for example, uh, you know, who's the target of a campaign uh, uh, by Mr. Orban? What's foreign funding, and why would it be a threat? What would be foreign funding? Is there? Because it's a foreign interference into the activities of the internal uh, actors. So I think we all know why, for example, in the Netherlands, you are trying to impose the same transparency rules for foreign funding for some NGOs active in your territory. Well, you you your is, is a very what broad. Is, I'm, but, I'm not. But what is your reason for that huh? law here in the Netherlands? Could you please elaborate? No, but on you, that? you. Well, first of all, you, you know, I didn't put that law on the table, and I might well disagree but with someone, it. Someone but there is there is nothing table. against transparency except when it's being used to. Um, uh, you know, to shed a very, very funny light on something. I mean, the, 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 there were some, there is uh, f funding by the, the Open Society uh, uh, organization, uh, there was funding by the Norwegian government, and there's funding by the EU. If you qualify all of that as foreign funding and, 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 and label it as a potential threat to the national security, then already you put some of the, these NGOs, who also happen to be government critical, you put them in a, in a certain corner. You, you shed a, a specific light on them. So, of course, they feel intimidated. If you want to feel intimidated, you will feel intimidated. It is about the European standards, where there are the framework for this kind of transparency requirement. Absolutely. And this is all about it, yes. and nothing yes. else. There are clear rules. It's, a, it's a, not actually not all of the amount, because just above a certain threshold. So I, it's, it's I'm not for actually the last, I'm for the last question, because um, um, you've been um, uh, traveling for a long time, early from this morning, five o'clock in the morning. So we, I try really to end on exactly the right time. So the last question is for you, madam. Yeah. Thank you, madam. <coughs> when you have so many problems with the EU, uh, EU, EU, and when you are so afraid for interference by the EU in your sovereignty, and when you don't want to implement treaties you signed, why don't you want to leave the EU? EU? <laughs> Because we see this with a clear, clear, clear question. Clear. Thank you. But I, I don't think we have a lot of problem. Uh, I think uh, those who think that we have problems should stop creating problems. And we signed a treaty which we fully comply with. And it is also all right when we, when we don't agree with something to object to it, to explain it, and when there's legal room for that, to fight f to defend our position legally within the normal framework. Just to say for a country that there is no rule of law, you are not complying with the, the uh, rules of the club because politically we are not on the same side or not uh, agreeing, I think this is where uh, you are not complying with the treaty rules because in the treaty there is also the requirement to respect national identities. And there is a very strict share of competencies and all Hungary is asking for to stick to these basics, what we signed up to. And if there are territories or there are domains of legislation which purely belong to national identity, then I, we only ask for some respect, nothing else. We never blame others. And I, I'm very sad about this whole Article 7 exercise, because at the end, it is ending up 
with dividing gaps between member states, and we are losing focus, and we are not focusing on the real challenges. Actually, what's dividing is not the Article 7 procedure. What's so, dividing so, is so the policy of Orbán government. I'm, I'm looking. I'm looking for a close. Um, um, uh, so um, <laughs> I just, I just want to very, very briefly close off, and I, I, I like to say a few positive things, and I like to thank you all very, very much. I know you haven't been uh, uh, able to ask every one of you to be able to ask questions. There were four questions: two women and two men, which is <laughs> fortunate. Thank you very much for your question and for attending. And uh, my deepest respect to the minister who w woke up this morning, talked uh, uh, for one and a half hour uh, off the top of her uh, uh, mind, you know, without prepared questions. It's really wonderful, I think, that you both uh, agreed to come and that the, Your Excellency uh, Judith Varga was able to come and to do this. I think one of the most wonderful things is that we debated all sorts of practical things, also the legal things, political decisions, values even. Um, we agreed on some, we disagreed on, <laughs> on others. I think, it's, I think this is democracy and I think this is a European conversation on values and the way of democracies operate. So I think it's wonderful uh, uh, that we have seen this and we are able to organize this. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, for being instrumental in it. Thank you very, very much for being uh, so open and so willing to talk so so, so much time uh, uh, without any prepared questions willing to come here. So uh, the same, of course, wonderful that an MEP travels here and a professor from Maastricht travels here to do exactly the same thing. I think it's all because we care about the political system in Europe and it's all because we care about uh, uh, especially Hungary, which I think is a wonderful and beautiful country where um, I think everybody uh, here is very much uh, uh, feels very deeply for because that's why we're all here on an evening like this instead of being home. Thank you very, very much and hope to see you again. <laughs>